Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, it's Monday morning. Um, over the weekend, there was an event here. How many people participated in the hackathon? Raise your hands. I know some of you aren't raising your hands who participated. Now, leave your hands up if you were in the group that won the hackathon. So let's give these guys a little round of applause. As if they needed it, given all the free stuff they're going to get. So uh, if you're here next year, it was, it was really a, a very cool event. So, and it was really pretty amazing what people were able to build in 24 hours um, and how little sleep uh, people were able to, to survive on. Um, all right, so today we're going to continue on talking about files and file systems. Uh, on Friday, uh, I answered some really incredible questions, so uh, we slowed down a little bit. But today we're going to continue uh, looking at where the different parts of the file that you're used to interacting with come from, where some of those semantics come from. Then we'll get into hierarchical file systems. We'll unpack a little bit about naming, things that maybe you guys haven't thought about in terms of why hierarchical file systems are set up the way they are. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the design goals of file systems and what makes file systems different from each other. Because if you've used most computer systems, you're probably pretty used to what file systems are like. Right? And the differences between them may seem very sort of small and cosmetic. But it turns out that they're all providing you a fairly familiar, similar interface in terms of hierarchical uh, naming and you know, directories, et cetera, et cetera. A uh, certain set of features that people have kind of gotten used to. But under the covers, when it comes to how those things actually map onto blocks on disk, that's where the differences are. Right? And that's where the interesting design uh, is going on. Right? And we'll, we're going to talk as we go forward about several different file systems that have designed themselves very differently to solve different problems right? in response to different characterizations of I.O. And, and different file access patterns. Okay? All right. So we, we, are, we are seriously trying to catch up on grading. Uh, my, uh, let's see here. My, my wife is in Boston for the next three days. Uh, so I'm going to be living kind of like the old bachelor lifestyle, uh, which will involve a lot of grading, right? When I, when I, was, uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, I don't know, I guess I would watch a lot of television when, when my wife left town. But now that I'm a faculty member, I have to catch up on grading, right? So uh, hopefully this will be done in the next few days. And, and once it starts to happen, then we're going to return a lot of things to you because there's a lot of things that are kind of like very, very close. So I know I've said this like 50 times, right? But it will be true at some point, right, uh, before May. Um, so we're getting to, we're, we're, I'm starting to hit my own set of deadlines here, right? Uh, okay. Uh, any questions about the stuff we talked about on Friday? We talked a little bit about files. I had some great questions about, about the file uh, interface. Uh, we talked, what did we talk about? We talked about really file basics. And then we talked a little bit about uh, Unix file semantics as far as process uh, relationships between files and processes. So any questions about this material? Questions about files, going once, going twice. OK. So what does a file have to do? The least a file has to do to be useful are the our late arrivals, back of the room, both late and in the back, so destined to answer review questions. Why don't you tell us, what does a file have to do to be useful? Provide the data. Provide data. That's to store data. OK, and then what's the other thing? OK, so persist the data. It has to store data persistently. That's what processes expect. But what else? What do they have to be able to do with that data? They're going to store some data, and then later they're going to try to? Well, they want to find it, right? So a file needs to reliably store data and also has to be able to be located, right? So that's to be some handle. And this has to persist as well. I mean, the handle can change, right, if you move a file or rename a file. But there has to be some way for the process to request the data that it's stored, OK? So we talked, also talked on Friday about file metadata. And we talked about some interesting design decisions when it came to storing file metadata. So other than the contents that are in a file, right, what other information about a file m might we want to know? Okay. File size, OK. So that's, that's, that's uh, permissions, I heard. Anything else? So we talked about attributes. We talked about file systems that actually provided flexible attributes. But what's, what's one set of attributes that a lot of standard file systems provide without any special support? What about time? 
access times, modification times, when was the file created, last access or modified, permissions, you know, who is allowed to do what to the file, or what processes are allowed to do what to the file, and then, and then we talked about some other things, okay? So, we talked a little, we talked, I presented sort of open close, right? This is the portion of the Unix file system interface that deals with establishing relationships between processes and files. Before a process can use a file, it has to call open. When it's finished with a file, it calls close, right? And this, these are interesting, right? Because on some level, you know, for example, does a process have to close a file? How many people have ever used, you know, Python or any, how many people have ever done file I.O. with any language? How many of you always remember to close all your files when you're finished with them? All right, so what normally happens? If you forget to close the file, what normally happens? When, when does the file get closed? When the process exits, right? Uh, we, we would hope, right? So, so close is interesting because close is just kind of a hint right, to the system that I'm done using the file, right? I mean, it is binding. I have to be done using the file. I can't use that file handle anymore. But, but on some level, close, processes aren't required to call close. It's just nice if they do, right? What's one reason that I might have to call close? Carl? You're using an ancient HPEC operating system that doesn't flush out the buffer and if you don't close it? Well, right, I mean, yeah, actually a lot of file, a lot of uh, operating systems and a lot of even modern languages won't flush the contents of the file. So close also sends a signal to the operating system that any data that the operating system has cached, which we'll talk about later, should be written to the file, right? So that's the point at which there's no point caching information for that process about that file anymore, and so I can flush the cache to disk, right? But what's another reason that I might need to close a file? You guys are in the middle of implementing assignment two, right? So you guys should know, what, what might a process run out of, causing it to have to close files? Yeah, John. File handles. File handles, right? So most operating systems don't provide processes with an infinite number of file handles. And if you're trying to provide processes with an infinite or near infinite number of file handles on assignment two, my suggestion is don't do that. Um, that's a really bad idea. I, when, I w when I took this class, my, my short-lived partner for assignment two uh, was trying to allow processes to open two to the 32 files, potentially, right? Uh, and actually a lot of the code that he sent me via email for assignment two was dealing with overflow, right? So what would happen if the process tried to open two to the 32 plus one files, right? Because that would really be a critical situation because it would, you know, it would wrap around to zero and we had to handle this very carefully all over the place. Never mind that there was no, <laughs> there's no way that the process was going to even get like two to the 10 files open before your little operating system crashed, right? But, but these, this is the kind of, this is the little uh, design quagmire he had, he had gotten uh, stuck in. All right. Okay, so, but, but again, so why, why do we want processes to provide these sort of hints to the operating system about when they're using files? What, what can I do? if I know when a process is about to use a file and when it's done using a file. We already talked about one thing, which Carl pointed out. When it's done using the file, I can flush the cache and write those contents to disk persistently, okay? What else can I do when, it, when the files, well, what, why might it be good to, to know when files are open? You know, Carl, you answered the last question. You want to take a guess? Why? Why, why, would, why might the operating system like to know why files are open or what files are open? Because if a process opens a file, the uh, process will notify the offset to the file. So that's possible, right. I mean, the idea of open is that I'm sending a signal to the operating system and I'm going to use that file. But why, why do this? Why not just have read and write take file names? That would work, right? Okay, so I can, I can use the process's intention when it opens it to make sure that it's doing what it said it would do with the file, right? If a process opens a file read only and then tries to make a write, I can stop that write from happening. But, but what's more fundamental here? Why do I care about the process? What's that? I can improve performance, right? I know what processes, what files on the system are likely to be used, right? Before, I know that before a process reads or writes to a file, it has to open it. So it has to tell me, hey, I'm about to use this file, right? And so I can keep a smaller, 
uh, you know, circle around the, pro the number of files on the system that are actually in use, right? And I might be able to do some things performance-wise in the cache or uh, in other parts of the system to optimize those files for access, right? Because those are the ones that are actually going to be used. Okay. All right, performance, and then what's, what's, the other, what's the other reason? What else might I be able to do by forcing processes to open and close files? Right, so I might have some semantics as o uh, associated with open, where, for example, I might guarantee a process exclusive access to a file, right, when it opens it, meaning that another open on the same file is going to fail. And because I have to call open, that means that I'm granting that process exclusive access to the file for some period of time, right? Okay, and then, and then I, I pointed out that some network file systems don't do this for, for you know, fairly good reason. Okay, any other questions about the file material that we covered on... Friday. All right, going once, going twice. So we're going to, okay, so let's continue on. Remember, there were, there were three uh, sources of the, 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 your usual idea about what a file is, right? One is what I think of as like the basic, you know, the basic job of a file, right? Which is to hold data persistently and to be able to be found, okay? The other, you picked a good spot today, buddy. Uh, the other, uh, the other, part of a file semantics comes from Unix, right? From the Unix file system interface. And, and there's nothing, you know, that's just how Unix has decided to offer processes that use Unix-like semantics access to files, right? There's nothing universally true about that. that. That could be different. And on Windows, I'm guessing that the file system interface is different, right? I don't use Windows, and I don't know what that interface looks like, but I'm guessing that it's somewhat different, right? And then the third place that we get a lot of what we're used to thinking about files is, is because of hierarchical file systems, which we're going to get to today. But let's keep talking about Unix semantics, right? So one thing you guys are finding out in assignment two is that Unix semantics for read and write are that the offset, the location that reads and writes are performed to is implicit, right? Read and write don't take a location parameter. They operate on a location that is saved for each process. And again, this is not a requirement. This is simply a convenience. It's simply the kernel saying, hey, by the way, I'll keep track of where you were reading and writing to the file, right? Because I know that, you know, for example, a lot of writes are sequential, right? That's a common way of writing to a file, is just writing the file from starting to byte zero and finishing it byte n, right? Reading a file in that way is also fairly common, right? But this is not, again, I mean, this is not something fundamental about files. This is just something that Unix does you know, to make things convenient, right? Where else, so, so let's, say I wanted to, let's say I wanted to implement, for whatever reason, um, something where the operating system didn't store the file offset. Where else could I store the file offset that would be fairly transparent to processes? What else could remember the file offset from call to call? Ben? Well, okay, but so, so here, that's, okay, this is a great, this is a great claim. So what's wrong with storing this information in the V node? Why might I want, not want to have the offset in the V node? So it would be global, right? And I don't really want a global offset. I want a per process offset, right? But if multiple processes have the same file open, I don't necessarily, unless it was the opens are shared explicitly because of fork, I don't necessarily want to share them. So if I open a file and I didn't you know, duplicate the file handle somehow, then I don't necessarily want to see reads or writes the effect of reads or writes on that file object, right? So rather than going down, what about going up, right? Going up the stack. What's that? File descriptor. Well, okay, again, you guys are talking about kernel data structures. I just said the kernel's not going to track where the, where, the, where the location of the last read or write came from, right? Where, where can I store that information? I can store it in the C library or something. Now, that would make it difficult to share after fork, right? Potentially. Well, not impossible, but difficult. It would change the semantics of how it was shared after four. But again, so this is not really a, a requirement. This is, this is a convenience. And it's also, of course, done expressly because of fork, right? Because it, you know, the semantics of file handles after fork allow processes to do IPC. And if the offsets aren't shared, that becomes more difficult, right? All right. This is a low energy room today. Best and everybody get up, stand up. No, I'm, I'm serious actually standing.
All right, stretch a little bit. I know it's Monday. It's like the uh, it got cold again. You know, it was feeling like spring, and you now it got cold. So, so clearly, clearly people are. You know, <laughs> these people have just started assignment two. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. So now, let's, let's hold it back. Okay. So again, use open and close to establish relationships. Now we're just going to go quickly through the Unix file interface, right? Reading and writing are for performing reads to a particular uh, file that I have open. I think this, you guys understand this stuff. You're implementing it, so I, I'm just going to sort of scoot through it really quickly, right? And then lseek is, is the way that I actually adjust the file pointer explicitly, right? So this is how I adjust the offset explicitly. Read and write do it implicitly. It comes along with the call. lseek is how I do it explicitly. Okay, so again, I think you guys are see this, you're building it, you're intimate with it. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bother. All right, what call haven't I covered here? Dupe. Why, why, why not cover dupe? I mean, I, I don't think dupe. Dupe doesn't really have anything to do with manipulating files, right? Dupe has to do with manipulating a process's view of files, right? But I think, you know, when I was thinking about this, it's like, ah, uh, okay, you know, dupe. Yeah, I mean, dupe is kind of a, a nice way of, of, again, manipulating the way the processes look at files, but dupe doesn't have any effect on the file itself, right? Whereas all these other calls could potentially do that. Open and close, of course, don't really have much effect on the file, but at least they're somehow involved with maintaining a view of the file. Hi. All right. So, fi so, so we talked a little bit about the file sort of on its own. Now we've talked about the relationship between processes and files and how Unix semantics come into play there. So now let's talk about a file system, right? A whole system of organizing multiple files, right? Like one file by itself is not really that interesting, right? Um, but files together start to make something that's a kind of a really, really powerful way of, of storing and querying data, right? So simplest requirement for the file system goes back to our requirements for the file. I have to be able to find the file, right? I want to give the operating system a name, and I should get contents back. And that means that the name has to be unique across the entire system. Seems kind of obvious, right? So let's say that I have a file system, right? And I'm trying to keep my names unique, and I'm writing a series of letters to various people. Uh, and you know, so this, this is pretty easy, right? So I start off, I write a letter to mom, you know, I write a letter to to my wife, I write a letter to Choo Choo, uh, in dog language. Um, I write another letter to my wife. I write a third letter to, uh, to my wife. So, so again, you guys are so brainwashed by hierarchies, right? Did you probably think this is just so dumb, right? Like, what, why not just use a hierarchical namespace? Well, early, there were some early file systems that didn't use a hierarchical namespace or had a very, very limited support for hierarchical namespaces. So what you have is a flat namespace, right? So imagine you had one directory on your computer and every file had to go in there, right? And every file had to have a unique name. So when I was writing these slides, I thought it would be really interesting to count the number of files that I had on my laptop and figure out how long would the file name have to be if it was composed of, if it was composed of, you know, if it had to be unique, right, how long would the file name have to be to cover the entire number of files on my system? So I started running find in my root folder, and after about half an hour I got bored and I killed it. Right? But there are a lot of files on your system, right? And, you know, and, and, and a lot of them are small files, and to some degree, the, the, the hierarchy starts to, to provide some form of organization and semantics. So, but the point is that, again, I mean, keep in mind, hierarchical file systems were kind of a new thing at some point, maybe in like in 1962 or something, but, but it happened, right? And so at some, at some point, you know, we started to get this directory model, and it's used, useful to think about sort of why this happened, right? The big thing that, that hierarchical file systems allow me to do is they allow you to view only a portion of your entire computer at once, right? And this is kind of a powerful idea, right? I mean, this is used in a lot of ways when we design systems, and maybe it's a, kind of another design principle that we're getting to. But, you know, don't give a don't give the user a view of all the features at once, right? Don't give a user the view of everything in your system at once, right? 
allow them to organize the way that they look at the system, right? So now, rather than, you, could you imagine if you had to sort everything in one directory running ls, right? You'd run it and it would sit there like churning away for five or six minutes, right? You know, and then you would pipe it into less and you'd sort of like have to figure out where things were, right? So now, you know, I can keep my directories any size I want. You know, a directory can have two files in it, it can have 2,000 files, it really depends on what I want to do. But it allows users to create essentially views of the underlying files, right? Views that are organized on some level by, hopefully organized by, by something meaningful, right? So here's, you know, an example of how I've organized my, my, my letters, okay? So one requirement that we do impose is that every file should have a canonical name, right? So there should be one name on the file system that references that file, right? And you know, I guess that's not actually true all the time, so I guess I'm glad I have that disclaimer, right? But, but you can imagine that we can start from a place where every file has one unique name, right? So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between names on the file system, right, and the file contents, right? And, and at some level, you can think about a position that the file has within this now hierarchical file system that I've built, right? So, so let's, so let's think about what it means now that I have this idea of location, right? Location is associated with the view that I just described, right? So I'm giving you a view of the file system, and that view is associated with you being in some particular place, right? Like some location on the file system where you can see other files, right? A certain set of files that's associated with that location, right? So what does this mean? Well, it means, first of all, I need to be able to move around, right? I have to be able to navigate the file system somehow, right? And you know, I might want to navigate both in a relative way, right, relative to where I am, you know, meaning that my locations now might include pointers to other locations, right? I know this seems really obvious, but just bear with me, right, because it's, it's kind of cool to think about all, how all this stuff fits together, right? Um, and, and again, so the other, all right, um, the, the other thing that's interesting here that, that, again, we don't necessarily think about, and it's, it's so natural, is that location and names are bound together, right? So when I give you a full path name to a, to a file on my computer, not only is that name unique and guaranteed to be unique across the entire system, but it's also associated with the location, right? And again, you guys have just absorbed this Kool-Aid over years and years that, you know, when you get up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror and you're all pink, you think you look normal, right? Like, but but this, is, this is really interesting, right? And, and this, the way that these things get coupled is kind of nice, right? It's very elegant. All right. So, why are, so here's an interesting question maybe somebody can help me with. Why are file systems normally organized into a tree, right? You know, a single root or maybe, depending on the file system, a set of roots. And, and some sort of, you know, uh, direction within the file system. Acyclic, right? No cycles. Why? Why are most file systems organized this way? What's that? Easy searching. Easy searching? Okay, I hadn't thought of that. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's possible. What else? Single name, single. Okay, so we're getting closer, right? So this goes back to our unique name requirement, right? So I have a clever example here, right? Here's my file system, okay? The green things are locations or directories in the file system, and this is a file, right? So, my question is, what is the name of this file on this system? How many possible names does this file have? Is, is there a unique, can, can, can you even, like, there's two ways to answer this question. One is, you can write a function that generates all possible names for this file. The other is, you can say, this does, question doesn't even make sense, right? Because named well, relative to what, right? You know? So there's, there's, no, there's no name for this file, right? This file is struggling. Now, okay, so let's say, you might say, well, I need a starting point, right? I need somewhere to start. You haven't given me a, a point of reference from which to generate canonical names. So let's say now I give you a root, right? So u is now your root, okay? So now, what is the name of the file? How many possible names are there? No, there are many. <laughs> you used to love me. You used to love well. <laughs> you, me, love to, used, you, me, love well. Right? 
So I still have a problem here, right? I've got a root, but what do I have in this file system that's making this difficult? I have a cycle, right? OK, so now I'm going to break the cycle. And now I can say the name of the file is you used to love well. OK? And this is why we do this, right? This is why we have a root. And this is why we don't allow cycles in our file system, is because we want files to have at least one canonical name, right? A canonical name is a name that's not relative to anything. It's relative to the root, right? So here, the canonical name is, again, you used to love well, right? What's one relative name for this file? What's one relative name that's, that starts at the root node? You guys are used to Unix. Give me another name for this file, right? Give me another path that resolves to the same file. It starts at u. How about this? You used to love me well. That works, right? Here's another relative name, right? This one starts here. Love me. Let's see, love me, dot, 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 love me, dot, dot, well, right? So anyway, I thought this was fun. Th th this, is, this is based off this poem, right, which I like. It's a sestina. I'll leave it up for just 10 seconds so you guys can read it. Uh, it's, it's quite cute. Um, but anyway, this was the generator for this example. Any questions about this stuff? I know this stuff seems really obvious. And maybe it's good that it's obvious. It's good that you guys have absorbed it. But I wanted you guys to see kind of the reasons for some of these things, right? Any other questions about this? Yeah. Right, right. So, so OK, this is a good point, right? So some early email clients adopted this sort of hierarchical directory structure, right? Now, you know, there's a lot of people who have, who have, who have attacked, uh, not this poem, but the you know, hierarchical directories in general and said, you know, like, why is this a good way of organizing information, right? How many people have a file cabinet at home where your file folders have subfolders that themselves have subfolders that can have pointers to other folders. I mean, most people that aren't weird don't organize things like this, right? So it's not clear that a hierarchical file model, right, despite the fact that we've been programming it into you guys for, for decades now, right, is, is really necessarily a great or natural way of organizing information. But there were early email clients that said, OK, well, you know, people like folders, right? And, and we'll have folders with the same set of semantics that we're used to with hierarchical file systems, right? What's different about Gmail labels? How do Gmail labels differ from the, because you, you, can, you can organize your Gmail labels in a way that makes them look very much like, like a hierarchical file system. You have labels. Right, right. So, so labels in Gmail can be, a, so for example, if you click on a label and you click on another label, right, if you were in a ty typical traditional hierarchical file system, you would see two different sets of email, right? But in Gmail, you know, labels can be applied to any, to any, uh, any email, and emails can, can have multiple labels. And when I click on a label or when I use labels, what I'm viewing is the set of all, ugh, keep calm. Um, the set of all emails that have that label, right? And there's no, so there's no, you know, mail can very naturally be in several places at once, right? You can imagine building a file system that works that way, right? Where rather than associating a file with a unique location, people just put a label on it, right? And then the way that I access the file system is I choose a label, and that label shows me the files that have that, right? You could probably implement something like that on top of normal file systems, right? But again, it's a really interesting question about whether hierarchical file systems matter anymore, period, right? Given the way that most people access their computers now, which is, again, if you're not weird like me and old fashioned, you just use Spotlight or, you know, Windows. That, that, does Windows still have the dog? The woof woof, like, <laughs> file dog or whatever? Speaking of dogs, where is my dog? Um, is he over there? Oh, okay, good. Um, yeah, so, so anyway, so the, you know, search is, is pretty big. Okay. So let's, so let's switch gears now, now that I've bored you to death talking about things that are obvious, right? And let's talk about some things that are a little less obvious, right? 
So what are the design goals of a file system, right? So we've really, up till now, been talking about the types of things that a file system is going to try to accomplish, right? One of the things is that I need to efficiently translate file names to file contents, right? Names are the handles that processes use when they, open and when they open files. And so one of the things I need to do is path name resolution. I need to take the name and I need to figure out what are the contents that a process expects when it uses this name, right? I need to support changes to files, right? File content changes, right, causing file attributes to change, and the file location can change, or really the file name, right, given that names are coupled to locations in a fairly direct way, right? I guess one thing I should have put on here that I didn't put on here was that preserve data, right, should be goal number one, right? Do not lose stuff. And yeah, I should have put that on there. I'll, I'll fix it. Right, so, 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 you know, job zero is don't lose things, right? The rest of these are features after storing data reliably, right? Like, if you fail a move, that's okay, right? If you attempt a move and you lose data, that's not okay. Right? So, so really, on some level, keeping file contents secure is, is number one, right? I want the file system is going to try to make access to files as efficient as possible, right? This improves performance on the system. We know that the disk is slow, okay? And the rest of the system in many ways is frequently bottlenecked on the, bottlenecked on the disk, and so the file system is going to do its best to optimize access to single files, right? And then the other thing I'm going to do if I'm a clever file system is I'm probably going to try to think about file layout. And I'm going to try to think about how to optimize access to multiple files, right? So can I observe relationships between files that might mean that I want to put them in various places on the disk, right? Or there, there are certain clusters of files that might be often accessed together, right? And if I could do this in a clever way, especially if I can exploit some layout features of the disk, assuming I know them, which we talked about, then I might be able to do this better, right? And then finally, surviving failures. So there, there's, two, there's two things I want to happen, right? When the file, when the computer shuts down or you unplug it, you know, this actually happened in my machine during the hackathon towards the end. Someone just yanked the power cord out of it. And it was okay, you know, like it, it, it didn't, here's the thing, it didn't come up and the file system didn't forget where all my files were, right? Now, there are probably some file operations that were going on when the machine was suddenly disconnected from the power source that didn't finish, okay? But it's more important that we fail a couple of operations that were in progress, but be able to come back and, see st and still see a consistent view of the file system, right? So this is really, really crucial, you know? And, and what we're going to talk about in a second is that all file operations usually involve modifying multiple different structures, right? And one of the things that can happen is these modifications, part of it can finish, part of it doesn't finish, and so I have the file system in an inconsistent state, and certain file systems, when that happens, they just punt, right? And they say, ah, oh, I can't find anything anymore. You know, my uh, super block is corrupted, right? Or my inode table is broken, and I just, you know, sorry, you know, here's a few files back, and then the rest of them are kind of gone forever, right? So it, it, it might be hard, right? But I want a way to survive failures that allows me to either immediately see a consistent view of the file system or rebuild a view of the file system that allows as much of what was happening when the machine failed to, um, to have been sort of moved to disk, right? To be visible on disk. OK. So the files that we're going to talk about for the next few days all support these sort of Classic features, right? They support persistent state, and they, they use these hierarchical namespaces, right? So again, this is the part where, you know, rather than talking about stuff that seems obvious to everybody, because you guys are used to using this stuff, we'll talk about stuff that's happening down at the disk block level, and that's, I think, more fun, right? Because you guys probably don't know about that. Um, right, and so the difference happens in how these things are accomplished, right? So when we get down to the disk level, OK? You can really think about file systems as storing two types of data. The first type is the stuff that's in files, right? I mean, that's somehow you know, some of the more important stuff to store, right? The contents of a file. And those you know, get stored in something that we call data blocks. Um, and data blocks, as I just 
<laughs> as I just said, contain file data, right? So if data loss contain file data, what do index nodes or inodes contain? Directory, index, they contain not file data, right? Anything that's not file data, any metadata that the file system needs to translate names, to, um, you know, to, to, to locate different parts of the file, to allow files to grow and shrink, blah, 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 blah. All that stuff, you know, gets stored in these metadata or index nodes, right? And, and so directories, no, actually. So directories, it turns out, at least on the file steps that we're going to talk about, are actually implemented as regular files, right? They just happen to be regular files with this very special format, okay? All right, so again, coming back to our question. These are our design goals. What makes file systems different, right? So if file systems are all gonna provide this hierarchical uh, namespace, they all need to support the uh, standard Unix file system interface, we're talking about Unix file systems, what's different about them, right? What, what can possibly be different, right? Anybody? Any ideas? What makes these things different, right? Where, you know, or, or where would you see the differences? Let's, let's say that I gave you two identical file systems, okay? Two disk partitions, identical size, two different file systems storing the exact same data, right? The file hierarchies are identical, okay? So what, and I, and I asked you, well, let's say, uh, let's say I did this, I asked you, here are two file trees that are identical. Are the file systems the same or not? Where would you expect to see a difference? Well, right, but, but I mean, well, that'd be one thing, but again, where would you look to find a difference, right? What would be the easiest thing to look at to see if these file systems were different? And let's say the history of these file systems were identical. Like, I've, I've had two disks attached to my computer and I've just been mirroring every file operation, right? So where would you look to see if these two file systems are the same file system, or? No, no, don't, don't cheat, don't it's cheat. This, it's cheat. No, no, I'm asking a more fundamental question. What, where, what are files? What do file systems do fundamentally that makes them different? They're translating file operations into what? Operations on what? What low-level thing? Disk blocks, right? At the end of the day. What information gets stored where on disk? That's the difference between file systems, even if they're supporting identical file trees, right? Two identical file trees, same operations, same orders. If the file system is identical, the on-disk structures are going to look identical. If the file systems are different, the on-disk structures are going to look very, very different, okay? So on-disk layout is, is, on some level, the lowest place you could look, but the source of the difference is in the different data structures the file systems use, right? So how do they translate names? How do they allow files to grow and shrink? Where do they put updates to files, right? If you write over a portion of a file, where does that write go? And so we're gonna talk about, so this is the stuff that we'll start to talk about over the next couple days, you know? What happens at the disk block level, right? That's where, that's where things are different, okay? And then the other big source of difference that's, that's pretty interesting is how do they recover from crashes? How do they prepare for and recover from crashes? And there's, there was a lot of work in this area over a couple of decades. And now, again, now the file systems that, are, uh, that you use on most modern systems do a way, way, way better job of this than old file systems did, right? And they do it in a very nice way that, again, allows me to, you know, my machine's disconnected from the power, I push the on button, and boom, it's just there, right? There's no laborious, long process that has to run to rebuild the file system. Everything just appears where it, I expected it to be. Right? That's pretty nice, actually. It took us a long time to get here, so it's a, it's a nice story that we'll talk about a little bit when we talk about different ways of surviving failures. And again, a lot of it comes from preparation. Right? How do I prepare for a failure? What do I do so that when the computer comes back on, I have some state that allows me to recover and produce a consistent view of the file system? Okay? So what's hard about this? Right? What's hard about file systems? Well, on some level, you can think about a file system as just this big data structure, right? It's this big, complicated data structure. It might have multiple little data structures embedded in it, right? A lot of file systems use, you know, B plus trees or various types of efficient uh, data structures to locate uh, file contents, to translate names, et cetera. So 
So that's, and, and so you have this big complex data structure and making changes requires touching lots of different parts, right? So this is kind of the consistency nightmare, right? You guys looked at this stuff when we did the synchronization assignment, right? Now I've got all these changes to make to different data structures on these slow disks, right? Meaning that any change takes a long time. You know, I've got to modify this disk block, and I've got to modify this disk block, and then I need to write some data, I need to update the data, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and, and the problem is failure can happen at any time, right? So my, my, the, the window over which a failure can occur is so much bigger for file systems because disks are so slow, right? So I'm giving you a big target, right? I'm giving you a lot of time to pull out the plug when I was in the middle of doing something that required me updating multiple parts of the file, all right? So let me, let's go through an example here. And I, I know I haven't introduced you to too many of the on-disk structures yet. We're going to get there. But I just want to illustrate why this is difficult, right? So let's say I have a process, and it wants to write data to the end of a file. I'm going to do an append, right? This is pretty common operation, right? What does the file system have to do to allow this to complete, OK? Well, first, I need some space, right? The file's getting bigger, OK? So I've got to find some disk blocks to use to put the new contents, right? And there's probably a data structure on disk somewhere that tracks where those disk blocks are and whether or not they're in use, right? So here's my first thing. Find empty disk blocks. And once I've found them and I'm taking them, I better mark that they're in use. Because if I don't, somebody else might come grab them before the write's finished, right? And that would not be good, OK? Once I've got those disk blocks, now I have to somehow associate them with the file that the process is writing to, right? So these disk blocks need to go from being unallocated to associated with that file. So the next time a process opens a file, I better find those disk blocks. If it doesn't, then I can copy the data into them. But you know, no one else is ever going to see the append, including the process that's about to do it, right? So now the process is growing. I've got to make the process bigger. I've got to associate those disk blocks. And now this is potentially another structure I have to update. OK? I probably don't want to calculate the file size every time it's requested. So probably have some metadata I need to update. Right? The file size is getting bigger. I'm writing 4K to the end of it. So there's another write I have to do. Now, finally, you know, after I've done all that, I can actually copy the data. Right? And th these things aren't necessarily in order. Right? Certainly, I need to get disk blocks before I do anything else, because right? I don't have anywhere to put them. But some of these other things can go in multiple orders. Right? Maybe I adjust the size after the write's completed. Right? And again, from the perspective of a process or another person, another process using this file, all these things kind of have to happen synchronously. Right? So if, you know, if I get inter interrupted and I've got some disk blocks, another process shouldn't be able to use those disk blocks. Right? And if two processes are doing appends in parallel, you know, they have to be ordered, right? One of them needs to finish and the other one has to finish, right? So there's all these different ordering constraints and, and difficulties here. And remember, the other thing too that file system that keeps file system designers up at night. The system can fail at any point, right? Like at any point you can hit the power button or you know your dog can trip over the power cord or whatever, right? And and you know, you might be here, you might be here. Who knows, right? So you have to be prepared at any point for failures and, and essentially be able to recover and have some idea of what happened, right? And, and again, at the disk level, these are all these asynchronous operations, right? So depending on my disk structures, I've got a free, you know, I have a data structure that stores which blocks are in use. That's got to be updated. I've got a file structure that stores which blocks are associated with the file. That's got to be updated. I've got some metadata in the file that might be stored somewhere. That's got to be updated. And then I do actually finally have to write the data, right? So there's a, all these different parts that have to be. And part of the fun of file system design, as you can imagine, is, like I said, on disk layout matters. Right? when you have spinning disks, because moving the heads around all over the place doesn't work well. So now I've got this fun game to play. Right? Where do I put this stuff on disk? Right? Where does it actually go? And that's, that's what a lot of file systems spend a lot of time thinking about. Okay? All right, so I'm actually done on time for once, even a little bit early. Um, so next time we're going to talk about path resolution. We'll talk about actual mechanics of growing and shrinking files. How do those files? Uh, uh, how do the file structures actually allow things to, to get bigger and smaller? And then we'll talk a little bit, we're going to start talking about some of the principles of the Berkeley fast file systems. This is kind of a classic file system that gets discussed in operating system classes. It's very, very location based. 
But there are some nice design principles embedded in it, so we'll talk about that. There's one more minute if anyone wants to ask questions. Otherwise, you guys can just. I have a question about that, uh, yeah. that scenario you had. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Those are all logical steps in a program, right? I mean, and then I'm actually going to use yourself. You require by asking for that space against it. No, no, no. This all happens when I do a write. Process calls right. This is all stuff that, what, what I try to, to separate out here are the things that have to happen to different parts of the, potentially different parts of the disk, right? What are the logical steps? I've got to find some space. I've got to associate that space with the file. I've got to, you know, update maybe some file metadata like the access time and things like this, modify time, and then I've got to actually do the right, right? And all these steps, because they're all making modifications to disk blocks, right, take time. They might mean that the, you know, the drive head is bouncing all over the place, right? The bitmap's on the inside of the drive, the file's on the outside, the, you know, the, the free blocks are somewhere else, you know what I mean? So, so all this, these are all, from the perspective of the process, this is supposed to look synchronous. I call write, when the write finishes, the file's bigger, right? And the file system has to make sure that those blocks are allocated to file and all this other stuff, right? Doesn't write anything until it can no, make sure that it. So I guess I guess the point is it's so you're right. A lot of this stuff can get stuck in the cache, right? A lot of it might hit the cache, right? So and we'll talk about this. So so one classic thing that file systems do, and that the operating system does to improve file system performance, is it holds data in the cache, right? So. You do a write, and you think that that write's going to disk. But what actually happens is that write is in memory somewhere, and the operating system is waiting to write it to disk. Right? And we'll, talk about, we'll, we'll definitely talk about caching. Right? But at some point, right, the, the, you know, the, the write has to actually go to disk. If it's a file, it's going to behave like a file that you're used to. Right? And a, a big performance trade-off in file systems is how long do you hold data in the cache? Because the longer you hold it there, the more likely it is that it will never get to the file system. Because if it's in the cache and you turn off the power, that stuff's gone, right? Like the memory, it, it ain't coming back, right? So again, we talked a little bit about this before. On some level, the fastest file system is the one that never writes anything to disk until either, you know, the pro well, r really, until either you run out of cache or the machine shuts down, right? It just holds everything in memory for as long as possible. And then when you shut down the machine cleanly, right, it's like, oh, OK, now I got to, you know, like, you know, you, you, you can imagine, right? When is the disk useful? When the machine is off, right? That's when the disk is doing something useful. It's storing data persistently. When the machine is on, it's just a slow pile of junk that you're trying to get things on and off of, right? So if you can, if you can you know, use it as little as possible while the machine is running, that's the best way to improve performance. Right? It does have implications for fall hand, but that's a good point. Any other questions about this stuff? All right, I will see you guys on Wednesday.